So I'm waiting for your. Just take three months for the three monthly moving averages and the six monthly moving averages you get for the six months for November and December. Once you get the answer, you unmute. Some people can start with December, others can start with so that we go together. So for November, we will take the August, September, and October figures. We add and divide by two. Uh, divide by three, sorry. What are we getting? You have your calculators. Don't use your phone. Use your sand calculator. So I have the first one. Is 1357. Oh, sorry. Have you got in the December one? You know, you know, John. If I call your name and you don't. I respond, I assume you are not in this. Yes, Evelyn? Evelyn, you are talking. Beth, Beth Injora, Beth, Beth, can you hear me? Baby doesn't have a mic. Viola? Yes, sir. Can you give us the figure for December, three months? 1373. Mm -hmm. 1373. What's the figure for the six months moving average? For November, can I meet yourself and give us the answer? I'm still calculating. I'm saying the person who has completed to give us the answer. So 
So we need to add the averages for May to October to get the number for, then we divide by six. And let's people are not using scientific calculator. Very simple. What's the answer? Thirteen twenty-seven. Thirteen twenty-seven. Who is that? Beatrice. Wonderful. For December, you need June to November. We have now the November figure. I remind people you won't be useful in this class if you don't have a calculator. This class. Latin. 13? 63. Wonderful, 1363. So there we are. So that's how simple the moving averages are. You can go quarterly, you can do the, no, that was quarterly. You can go four months, we had quarterly and the half yearly. So you can even do the lesser the period, the more smooth the curve is and vice versa. So that's what normally happens. And when we are plotting for this data, if for example, you are taking quarterly, your mid will be now between the two months because we are taking four, we are taking three months. So your middle month will be the middle month. For example, when plotting the moving average, our midpoint or forecasting our, our April will be mid-February. Are we together? but we'll be coming mm -hmm. into the spotting of the scatter diagram later, later, in the, later in the semester. So our characteristic, what we can identify from this is that uh, the more the number of periods, if you look at the data between July and December, because it's comparable, you can see that the data for six months compared to the one for three months. Which one is smoother? Which one is more smooth? So you see the more the number of period in the moving average, the greater the smoothing effect. So as we increase the numbers, the data becomes more smooth. So you can see this curve, this 1257, then we are landing at 1292. Here we are moving from 1250 to 97. Seven, 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 seven digits not even seven, uh, we are talking about 47 digits. And here we are talking about 30, 35. So this one is a bit smoother compared to the three month moving average. And the second characteristic is different moving averages produce different forecasts. Now you don't expect to do a smoothing for two months or for five months and still get the same figures. And lastly, the more the randomness of data, with the underlying trend being constant, then the more the period should be involved in the moving averages. To mean, if the data has a lot of deficits, you take at the spikes that are more or less similar. That's the characteristic of moving average. And as a financial analyst, I wouldn't advise that we use this method of forecasting because it has a lot of deficits and these are the limitations the limitation number one is equal weighing we disregard to how more recent data is more relevant a finance student should know that okay however much we are trying to get the averages the most recent data is the one that the manager will use to make a decision for the coming period or the coming month or the coming year. For example, if an institution reports the year financials, let's say quarterly, like banks do. If they do quarterly, let's say January to March, 
they cannot say, let us work with the data for 2019, September to December. It will be misleading. So the most recent data is what is supposed to be important. But we can see moving average disregarding all this and taking the historical data. And then moving average ignores data outside the period of the average that it does not fully utilize the available data. Again, another deficit. Right now, could be the sales are being affected or they are on a nose dive because of Corona-19. If all factors were to be restored to normal, our sales would be better. But we can see what is happening. But moving average doesn't recognize this. We are just taking data all the way from January to June. We get average and there we go. We take February again to July. We get the figure and we plot. So to me, this data cannot be of any significant value when you are making or when you are using it to make a decision. And then lastly, where there is an underlying seasonal variation, forecasting with an adjusted moving average can be misleading. Exactly. That's what I mean by if we don't take into consideration the effects and we hold everything else constant, then whatever the outcome will also be misleading because we ignored the reality. Now, to avert this, we have what we call exponential smoothing. So to correct the error of the moving average, a better form of forecasting this data, the periodic data, is by use of exponential smoothing. And this is where now we weigh this data using a technique. And the formula is, our new focus will be the old forecast, but we use a constant, and this constant should be between zero and one. If it is over one, again, it is not giving us any probability. So it's alpha, the small number, between zero and one. Because we are using this number as a constant to try and make our data exponential. Of course, we have to decide on the constant that we are going to hold into account before we do exponential smoothing. Then we take the latest observation, we less the old forecast. Now this method involves automatic weighing of past data with weights that decrease exponentially. And by exponential, I mean they are a bit constant because our alpha or that constant that we take, the smoothing constant will be constant for all. For example, Using the previous data, the data that we've just worked on, and a smoothing constant of 0 0.3, generate monthly forecast for this data. And I've done for February. So for February, we assume that January is our base year, since we don't have any historical data, right? So if we put this in the formula, it will be, 1200 plus 0 0.3, which is our smoothing constant, into our latest will be 1200 minus 1200, which is zero. Zero multiplied by constant will get that to zero. So our data will be still 1200. Then we go to, uh, to the month of February. So we are going, not the month of February, we go to the month of March. Now the month of March, what we've gotten will be our old forecast. So our new forecast will be our old forecast, which is 1200. Uh -huh. Yes. Am I on notice, someone talking? So I'm saying our old forecast in this case will be for March will be 1200. Then we go into the smoothie constant is 0 0.3. So it will be into bracket, the latest observation, which is 1310, we less 1200. What do you get? Of course, the answer is there. So you can see what is happening. This is the working. So we are taking the old forecast plus 
our constant smoothing constant is 0 0.3 then we take the latest we less the old forecast we are getting 1225 one the figure for april let me the figure for april So our April figure will be 12.24 plus 0 0.3 into bracket thirteen ten minus 12.24. What are you getting? Our old forecast for March will be 1224. What are you getting? Other people should be working on me. On me. 1249.8. You're getting? 1249.8. We yeah, round it off to the nearest hole for purposes of this example. So it will be 1250. Good. Yes. For me. <coughs> now we have the old forecast, which is 1250. So for me, it will be 1250 plus 0 0.3 into 1270 minus 1250. Get the figure for me. Twelve fifty six. Twelve fifty six. Twelve fifty six. Then we have another figure here down here. We have the figure for November. November. So it will be thirteen fifty eight plus into zero point three in bracket twelve eighty minus thirteen fifty eight. Thirty-five. Yes. Thirteen. 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 Thirty-five. Five. Thirteen. Thirty-five. It is. So note, I had indicated that our value, our smoothing constant, because it is a probability constant should not exceed one should be between zero and one so we are talking of decimals between 0 0.00001 up to 0 0.99 so the higher the smoothing constant value the more the forecast is sensitive to the current status so if you put a very large constant you realize that it affects the outcome and the outcome might be misleading for example if you are talking about inflation Let's say, for example, the 0 0.3 is our inflation rate. Let's say the value of doing business or the shilling has shrunk to the dollar at a rate of 0 0.3 because of corona. So our inflation, if it is so high, then the figures will automatically go up. And therefore, it will be giving us misleading results. Characteristic of exponential smoothing, more weight is given on the most recent data, which is supposed to be the case. Any manager who worries about the future will be guided by the most recent data. All past data are incorporated, unlike in the moving average, where you are discarding the, the old data, and then less data is needed to be stored, unlike in the periodic moving averages. So you can see the exponential smoothing is better, all its characteristics are better than those of the moving average. I've said no manager is supposed to use the moving average. Just a concept of bringing us now to the exponential smoothing. Now we come to the decomposition of the time series. Anything that has life decomposes. Even services are perishable. We think that it is goods that are only perishable. 
if you don't offer a service in good time, that service will be perishable. For example, if someone is, let's say, diagnosed positive of COVID and they don't take measures that are expected to take them out of the situation, they will ultimately die. So decomposition of time series is coming now to make the exponential smoothing have some meaning. So time series has the following characteristic. The first one, it has a long-term trend to mean the tendency of us having spikes and having lows is very high. So that long trend, we call it a capital T. And I'll show you how we are going to use this to model. Then of course we have the seasonal variations and these are caused by the short-term periodic fluctuations. And a good example, we, are, we have examples there in Kenya, the price of maize during the harvesting season, we know what happened. On Friday, everyone is going to town, like today. So if you go to the, especially right now in the evening, matatus are full. So it is like the opposite of the weekdays. When everyone is rushing to go home, right now everyone is rushing to go to, to town. So you'll see that matatus are making better business on Friday as compared to a day like Sunday when people are indoors. Are you getting? Then we have the cyclical variation. Now we abbreviate that as S for purposes of modeling. Now we have cyclic variation in some cases, and this is where we have the medium term changes caused by factors uh, such as we, we could be having uh, the, the factors that will make us disappear or something to come and go. A good example is the drought in Kenya. It recurs after every seven years. So after every seven years, we expect because of the climatic changes, we'll be hit by a drought or a dry spell. So for cyclic variation, you can identify with it because it has more time or it takes a season or a longer period before occurring. And that's why we are calling it cyclic. You can see it's after seven days. When you are talking of the seasonal, we are talking about days like Fridays, Sundays. So you can see the frequency is a bit, is a bit higher. But for cyclic, it is taking longer for the same situation to recur. And of course, we cannot avoid now the random residual variation. And this is what will occur without our no. For example, the pandemic, nobody knew. The last time we had a pandemic was the swine flu and it came a long time ago. Things like war, fire, coup, these are things that we do not anticipate. But as a manager, you cannot avoid to take into consideration about such risks. Because once you are hit and you had not provided for that, ultimately, it's going to hit your business badly. And this is what happened to our country. 85% of the SMEs, they've been put down by COVID simply because they do not provide for uncertainty. And lack of provision for uncertainties has found them in a situation that they might not be able to, even despite the banks trying to resuscitate them. Some were given moratorium on the loans that they had taken. The moratorium period is over, but they have closed the shop. So the bank is at the verge of losing because the loans are defaulting, simply because they didn't provide for that particular time that we are calling the random residual variation. So for accuracy, all these aspects have to be put into consideration. And they are only four. You said we have the long-term trend, which is T, the seasonal, S, cyclic, C, and you have the random residual, which is R. Now, the whole process, when we take into consideration all the four aspects, this is what we are calling the time decomposition of time series because whatever will happen to the business, either long-term, either seasonal, either random, either cyclical has been provided for. So it's like you've decomposed the aspect of the 
time series. Now, we have this model and they have to be quantified into two. Uh, we have the additive and the multiplicative. Now the additive, this model will suit us when the components are independent or where the seasonal variation is not affected by the trend. So you can see what is happening. We are adding all of them. The long time, uh, the, the long term trend, the seasonal, the cyclic and the random residual variation. So where the S or the seasonal, the cyclic and the random are expressed as absolute value. To mean we are holding the other factors independent. Now for the multiplicative model, we are multiplying all of them. But in this case, the seasonal, the cyclic are expressed as a, as a percentage or proportion. So this model will be applied uh, when we have the high trends in increase in seasonal variation. And we'll come into the examples and see as we put this in practice. So of the four elements in the time series, the most important are trend and seasonal. Now forget about the cyclical. We've said it comes after a long period of time. If you look at the last time we had war or pandemic in this country, it's a long time. Now the rationale is most businesses are reporting their uh, financials in one year. At most, the generally accepted accounting principle is one year. So when we are talking of seasonal, and you can see it's taking some time, uh, uh, when we are talking of the, uh, of the cyclical and the random, you can see they are taking quite some time. So we are talking of now the multiplicative mo model trying to incorporate or the process of separating out our, our trend and the seasonal variation. And this is what we call decisionalizing the data. So when you are decisioning, it's like you are trying to eliminate all the aspects of season. Are we there? So we are considering only the long trend and the, and we are avoiding the cyclical and the random. So there are two approaches to this process. And one is based on regression. Now we know regression analysis, and we are coming to that next, is our next topic. And we also use the actual data as demonstrated in the moving average method. Now look at this. We have the data here. I want us to look at this data. So we have the year. We have four years and the four years are divided into quarters. So if we take our year as X and then our sales as Y, we have the dependent and the independent variable. So our Y will be dependent on the years. So we have the first year, quarter 120, quarter 232, quarter 362, and quarter 4 we have 29. So we can say our Y is 1, uh, not, not y, our X is 1, and our Y is the 4 the four quarters, 20, 32, and 62. So it will be apparent that there is a strong seasonal element in the above data. You can see quarter one what is happening. The numbers are oscillating between 20 and 27. So you can say there is some seasonal element that affects sales in the first quarter. And the first quarter is the period between January and March. Could be people have come from the spending spree and they don't want to buy. So they are buying strictly for let's say subsistence. So they are not doing what you call impasse buying. But when you come to quarter two and quarter three, we can see an upward trend. So quarter two is moving up, quarter three, is moving again up. But coming to quarter four, we are again on a downward trend. Could be people are now trying to save for the holiday season in December. They are not buying too much. They are waiting to go for the holiday. 
Anyhow, you could analyze this data your way. But the steps of analyzing, the first thing is to calculate the trend in the data using least squares method. You remember least square method? Do you remember least squared method? I'd rather we talk because I'll be terminating the lecture at this point in time. And if you are lost here, you'll be lost in the subsequent topics. Are we together? Yes. Kenyans, are we together? If you get lost here, you could be having some serious challenges in the coming days. So I don't want us to lose people in this first session. Is everyone with us? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sampling. I'm sampling, so I just need a few other hands. Yes. Yeah, is a yes. Yeah, I can see more yeses. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can see more yeses. I'm trying to open something. Good. So I want us on the same breath, we go on the, we have the question and I've identified our independent and the dependent variable for purposes of using the equation. So for purposes of using the equation, y is equal to ab plus x. And then we apply the least squares formula. And I am waiting. Can someone give me the formula for least squares? What's the formula? I don't want to pick on people's, on people, I don't want to name names. Guys, formula. So our quotas will be our x-axis. So I'm expecting us to have several columns because for the least squares method, we'll need the summation of y. I think I have the formula. post it here. Mm, so can we all see? Are we there? So for us to be able to get the least squares equation, you can see we need the summation of x. So you need to have that data arranged in a manner that will be able to get the summation. So you can alter the data. For year one, let the data face downward. Now 
working with the I think the Zoom class is not doing as good. Do you people have BBB? You have BBB? That we can use the... Can use the... The whiteboard. Know what has happened? Allow me to trying to pick this data. So I'm um, trying to pick this data. So this will be my, this is not X, this should be Y. Are we able to see? So this will be my year one. I don't know. Are we able to see the data? Yes. Now I want us to arrange this data in this form. Year one, I'm losing some data. So you can see year two, right? So I have the first, I have the, this is the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter and fourth quarter. Are we there? So this will be my summation of X. Then I have the summation of Y and these are the sales. So you can see what, are, what has happened is the data that was presented horizontally for purposes of helping me in getting the summations, I've tried to arrange that data vertically. That's where, what I meant by rearranging the data. Are we there? Yes. 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 Yeah. It is. yes. <laughs> So with this data, you can now be able to use the least squared method, isn't it? Yes. Can you copy these totals? Or why should I, why should we copy the totals? We are supposed to calculate, isn't it? Can you calculate the totals and apply or adopt uh, the formula? I've shared the formula for yeah. least squares method here. Can I give you some time to work on this? Let's give ourselves like 15 minutes, right? So it is 3.10, I'll be coming back at 3.25. The link is, the link is recurring, so you can log off to avoid misusing your bundles. You log back at 3.25, right? Shall we do that? Yeah. So ensure that you do the summations.
Are we there? Are we there? Jacqueline. Yes. Say hi to that Kenyan. So have we got in the equations? Have we got in the equation? Can you hear me? Yes. Have you gotten the equations? Yes. Uh -huh. So we go, whom am I dealing with? That is, that is Jane or Zipora. Who is talking? Jane. Jane, what is our Jane. and why? The first one for summation y is seven ten. Summation y is hello seven ten seven hundred yes seven hundred and ten uh huh sixteen a ah so seven hundred and ten. Uh -huh. Is equal to 16a? I'm trying to, yes, plus that 136b. Plus 136b. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The second one is Another person. 66, 61. Another person. Will give us summation EXY. Sixty six, sixty one. Sixty six, sixty one. Yes, and summation X squared is fourteen ninety six. So that will be summation X is one thirty six. Yes. So that will be 166a. Then we have the summation x squared. 1496. 1496. So we have those two equations. So
So we have 710 is equal to 16A plus 1, that is 6B, and 6661, 6661 is equal to 136A plus 1, plus 149, no, plus 1496B, right? Yes. So are we able to get the value of A and B? The constants. <laughs> you are up on a home. Zipora. A is twenty eight point seven. Yes. A twenty eight point seven. Twenty eight point seven. And B one point eight. And B is to be one point eight. One point eight. One point eight four. One point eight four. B. B is one point eight four. Yes. So we are able now to get the first part. So our trend line we can say is 28.7 plus 1.84, isn't it? Plus 1.84x. So our y is equals to yes. a plus bx, right? Yes. So yes. are we there? Yes. yes. I don't know how I'm going to. Let me try to stop and share and see whether, see how it will pan out. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's quite in summer, but I don't know whether it. Can you be able to see? Can I pull the table. So I'm in my crib and I'm trying to improvise. Eh? So can you see? So are we able to see? So we are saying our trend line is y is equals to a plus bx. And we've indicated that our A is 28.7, our B, our B is 1.84, 
1.84x. So this is the trend line, right? You can see, you can hear me? Yes. So once we are yes. there, our next step, if you look at the next step, after the first step, our next step is use the trend line to calculate now the estimated sales for each quarter, right? And we have 16 quarters. So can we estimate for the first quarter, what is the value of our X? The value of our X in the first quarter is one, isn't it? Yes. Can you see the value of X? So in our first quarter, our value of X is one. So what do we get? You just need to add 28.7, you add 1.84. What do you get? Do you people have a calculator? 30.58. Yeah, so we are getting 30.58. 5.8. So quarter two, our value of x is two, right? Yes. So we go substituting all the way. So we are going to go substituting all the way until we clear the 16 quarters. Are we there? Then the next step, yes. I want you to, yeah. we go, that, that will have covered now the trend line will have given us the step two and step three, isn't it? Then yes. we have the actual value of sales expressed as a percentage of the estimate. Exe uh, uh, expressed as a percentage of the estimate. In other words, we are talking of the actual sales over our estimates And we express this as a percentage. So as a percentage is to mean we multiply by 100. So the first value we've gotten is, I want you to look at the first value. The, for the first quarter, the actual sales were 20, isn't it? Yes. So our seasonal variation will be then 20 over 30, 0.58. Are we there? So as a percentage, what are we getting? Divide by 30.58. We are getting 65.4%. 65 yeah? 65.4%, yes. isn't it? So I would expect mm -hmm. we do the calculation for all the other for all the other quarters until we get to 65.4. Sasa mnanisikia ama naongea peke yangu? Tunakusikia. You are listening. You are listening. Are you seeing? Yes. Unaona kitu hapa. But your is breaking. Hapa nijiza. Sing your head. We are listening and looking. I'm trying to say our our Better view now to give now the variation. And for us to give the variation, we are getting now the actual sales from the quarter over the estimate. And the estimate is what we've gotten in our previous calculation, isn't it? Mm. And then we get it as a percentage. That is the way we are going to get the seasonal variation. So the seasonal variation for the first quarter will be, it, it will be our 20, which is the actual sales of our estimate, which was 30.58 multiplied by 100. We are getting 65.4, right? Yes. Can we do that for the subsequent? Can we do that for the subsequent quarters? Sour. Yes. I'm trying to work with the resources that I have here. So can we do the the for quarter two of the first year? The sales, the actual sales are 32. So for the value of x in the equation, we are going to have two, right? 
The actual sales are 32. So you get the trend. What are you getting as the trend? Thirty-two point four two. Thirty-two point four two. So thirty-two point yes. four two is to mean, as a percentage, we are going now to get our actual sales, which is thirty-two, over now the thirty-two point. You say thirty-two point four two. You multiply by a hundred. Yes. What are you getting? That is almost a hundred, right? What are you getting? 32 over 32 should give you 100, yeah? Yes. You are getting? Yes. 99. Uh, some people who are just saying yes, so I don't know. 98.7. Yeah, that should be 99. So what I needed to know is that I haven't lost anyone. So from there, our step four will be now to average the percentage variations to find the average seasonal variations, right? For example, Q1, we have gotten 65.4. Q2, you are telling me 99 point something, isn't it? So we'll get the Q3 and we'll get the Q4. Are we there? Yes. So the average percentage will be, we do that for year one, we add the totals, we do for year two, we add the totals, year three, we add the totals, and year four, we add the totals, and then we get the averages. Is that too much to ask? No. By averages, I mean we divide that by four. And it is from that that we'll be able now to prepare the final forecast based on the trend line estimates. In other words, we said that the adjusted forecast seasonally, we are going to avoid the cyclical and the residual value valuation, isn't it? So the formula for seasonally adjusted forecast will be the, we are going to use the multiplicative formula. So it will be our trend estimate we multiply by the seasonal variation. Yes. I want you to do that calculation and post it in the discussion before the end of this class. Is that too much to ask class? Any question before I leave, before I end the meeting? Any question? Zipora? Do you have any question? There are some people you just call the your name and they vanish. Nicholas Wainaina, the guy from Joro. Nick. Yes, sir. I'm saying we do the calculations and I get the feedback now on the other side on the portal. Is that okay? No problem. So guys, if there is no any question, I will end this session. We converse from the portal. So enjoy your evening as we meet in the portal. You can see there is one chat. Well, that's okay, that's okay.